The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. In Styria, we, though by no means magnificent people, inhabit a castle or schloss. A small income in that part of the world goes a great way. Eight or nine hundred a year does wonders. Scantily enough, ours would have answered among wealthy people at home. My father is English, and I bear an English name, although I never saw England. But here, in this lonely and primitive place where everything is so marvelously cheap, I really don't see how ever so much more money would at all materially add to our comforts, or even luxuries. So begins Carmilla by J. Sheridan Lefanu. This episode on Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. Hey everybody, we have made it to episode 10. Woo! This is Michael T. Bradley. <laughs> and Skix Maddox. And apparently very excited Skix <laughs> is here to do his first solo outing. I mean, obviously I'm still here and I'll try to guide everything like a fish, like a really smart fish. But uh, Skix will be taking the, the majority of the weight on uh, this run. A guide fish? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I'm, there's got to be a good fish-based pun there, but I'm uh, blanking on it. Uh, yeah. Before we get to anything about Carmilla in and of itself, I want to, as usual, pimp out the email address. That is dread.dialectic at gmail.com. Dread, a period, dialectic at gmail.com. Let us know if you agree, disagree, have any suggestions for books you think we should read, or if you have written a novella or novel yourself that you think... Uh, we should take a look at, then uh, go ahead and drop us a line. We would love to hear from everybody and anybody. Also, if single ladies in our area are dying to meet us. Specifically, if you're wondering, do I like Asian ladies? I do. <laughs> I've met a few that I liked. I always find that so strange when they come up and they're like, do you like Asian women? And I'm like, well, I guess. I mean, I don't, Not, you know, I mean, it's kind of a person by person sort of thing. Like uh, separately from other women. Right. It's like, I, I, I take all comers, if you know what I mean. Ew. Skix, go ahead and give us a basic plot outline of Carmilla. Okay, but I, I will start with a brief history. Carmilla was written in 1871, or published in 1871 uh, through 1872 as a serial. Fans of Bram Stoker's Dracula might realize that this is 26 years before Dracula. This is, I believe, the superior vampire novel of the two and it predated Bram Stoker's Dracula by 26 years. So Carmilla is uh, written from the viewpoint of uh, a young lady in a schloss in Germany uh, with her father. Schloss is German for penis. <laughs> Not quite. A few letters off. And it, it's hard for a delicate young lady to stay in a, in a, in a penis. But then again, you know, a sponge Conflict can live in a pineapple one. under the sea. Yes, well, uh, as with all Disney heroines, uh, her mother's dead. So her and her dad and, like, a slew of servants that are like wallpaper. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, we were there alone in the schloss. And then the chambermaid came in and said, mm-hmm. Okay, so we, we, we come from money, is, is what I'm saying. A slew of yellow wallpaper? Is that... We should read that one, too. That's a short. Yeah. To the actual story part of this thing, through an accident, they meet a, a woman and her daughter, and the woman is on an urgent mission, and she can't spare a single second, and her daughter can't stand the ride because she's ill. So these strangers suddenly say, look, take, take care of my daughter, and I'll be back in three months. Like you do. Yeah, this is a very Disney movie. The daughter is Carmilla, the title character. It's sort of uh, written like a diary entry. I believe at that time it was law that you had to write things that way. Nobody understood any other form of narrative. Right. But if you cut like two or three sentences off at the beginning at the end, it's, it's, it's a standard format novel. Uh, and for its day, it reads fairly modern to my eye. Our narratrix whose name I forget because she's fairly forgettable, to be honest, starts feeling weak. Languid is the word. There's some lovely vocabulary in this story. 
and she starts having nightmares of this dark figure at the foot of her bed, and they start noticing that Carmilla is a little odd in that she sleeps very, very late, gets agitated in the presence of prayers. I- historically, in this, in this place, the legend of vampires is, is known. They are just simply genre-blind, <laughs> because it takes them a while to figure out what's going on. Uh, oh, also, uh, Carmilla is forbidden to tell the secret of her and her mother. This is part of the understanding when, when, when the, the family agreed to take her in. They weren't allowed to know anything about her, where they're from, <laughs> what the mother's mission was, anything. Spoiler, the mother disappears from the story, never comes back, is never explained. Hmm. In fact, her presence is very odd once you get the, get the final story. The, the really interesting stuff, and, the, and the, the reason that this story is memorable to modern readers, is that Carmilla falls in love with our female narrator. Now, either the author or the narrator is really stupid. The narrator says, And she was laying across my lap and hugging me and kissing me and telling me she wanted to be with me forever. How strange I thought she is acting. I don't understand. <laughs> it's, it's as if she were a boy in disguise, but no, she's not a boy in disguise. And, and the, the narrator seems to respond positively to this attention as well. But they spend a lot of time kind of describing how Carmilla is hitting on her. But I, I think the understanding of the author is that this was a, a sort of vampiric fascination she, mm. she was putting on her. But boy, does it read like lesbians. Our typical setup is the good, the bad, the ugly. Good, what we liked. Bad, what we didn't like. And then the ugly is the monster at the end of the book. I, I guess, you know, we've kind of given it away multiple times here. There's there's vampires. But we can talk about kind of the what, what distinguishes them and so on and so forth. Also, possibly there are lesbians. That's I guess <laughs> we've spoiled that as well. Maybe this one you could take out any reference to uh, uh, to vampires and just make it that she is a lesbian, and that's kind of the horror l- lurking beneath the surface here. It wouldn't be um, too hard to do that. She'd have to be like 300 years old and have a contagious disease. But other than that... <laughs> so the good. Let's talk about the good, Skix. Uh, uh, oh, no, wait. Actually, first, trigger warnings. Are there any trigger warnings for this book? If the little bit I've described about lesbians and vampires isn't triggering, then nothing else will be. So, yeah, let's let's talk about the good. All right. Um, uh, Le- Lefanu has a, a good and interesting use of language. He goes a bit kind of highfalutin, talky-talky, extra verbiage, like the style of the times, but not too bad. I mean, it reads like modern language most of the time. The characters, while bland, are fun. You know, I didn't read all of this, but I did read some bits from it and everything, and I'll admit, I felt very strongly the opposite of that. I didn't think it was horrible, and, like, if we had... You know, if we were still doing so, we both read it. I, I definitely could have forced myself through this, but I found that the couple of chapters that I read, I kept kind of every couple of paragraphs, I would think like, oh my God, what's something that I can search on Wikipedia? You know, just anything to kind of break up having to read this very... It's. I didn't find it highfalutin. I just found the syntax very tortured and different than what I'm used to. And I. I mean, you know, I prefer much more straightforward stuff, right? Which I mean, I know that's weird because our starting episode is Choir of Ill Children, and I loved how ridiculous and poetic and over the top that was. But uh, for the most part, just this older style of writing. You know, like I. I enjoy Lovecraft and Machin and things like that, but they. They seem so stylized that I feel like they fall under something different. I, I will say that I found it more readable than Dracula, that's for sure. Yes. You know, as a reader, you, you probably, in your mind, already know from what we've just said about the language, whether it's for you or not. I like it, though it is wordy and antique, and it's too much of that for, for Michael, and that's fine. I, I, I started to say I really liked the characters, and then I realized that they're really bland, but I still liked them. There was one character toward the end that is like the most thoroughly described character. Not the main characters, but this this little walk-on. He's interesting. I want a story about him. <laughs> he's mm. he's essentially the um, the Van Helsing the Van Helsing style character, and he's more interesting than Van Helsing. He's a kook. I like him. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like you know? Because I know like in a lot of 
older things, you'll see women, young women especially, much more physical and being all kissy and I love you forever and things like that. And it's not seen as homosexual overtones because it was just kind of like, oh, women are more expressive and more emotional and things like that. And that's kind of how they felt in the times. Do you feel that the lesbian undertones are a modern imprint on it or was it actually representational? I think we probably meet in the middle because it was excessive even for the time. I'm not sure a reader at the time ago, well, I know they wouldn't go, that's a lesbian, because that wasn't as a whole story about the, the history of the language of queer. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I, I do own that I'm, I'm putting some on it, but not as much as, as, as you might think, because, I mean, literally, hugging and kissing and I want to be with you forever and crawling up in lap and cuddling and, like, about half of that I can, I can put off on, on it's the 1800s and... <laughs> They probably had some great, bizarre euphemisms for it back in the day. If I, I assume lesbian wasn't actually in the lexicon yet, but it's like, oh, she hangs her drapes at three o'clock, if you know what I mean. Or... <laughs> As I understand it, it was not understood to be a type of person at that time. So it's something that women did from time to time, which was, you know, sinful and deviant. But there wasn't, like, a woman who primarily wanted to do that that makes sense like all women are straight but every now and then a deviance will take hold right and if they're deviant enough they'll go into an asylum and get electroshocks that's fun an evil bizarro universe version of the book sexual fluidity which is an entirely different conversation so let's talk about the bad what did you <laughs> dislike about the book skix well a lot of what i disliked was just part of the times so when our narrator was ill they called in a doctor and the doctor examined her and then the doctor and her father went away to talk about her diagnosis, and she was not allowed to hear it. <laughs> it's like, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I mean, sort of like casual classist and sexist stuff like that. Not as bad as a lot of stuff of its time. Though, to be fair, she is a child, right? So it, it's something where even today the parent would still have the final say? She's 19. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> She's 19, and Carmilla is 300 and something. Really, that's it. Just just some artifacts of the times that I find off-putting. But, but again, not as bad as, like, Lair of the White Worm, definitely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not as bad as, as a lot of Lovecraft. I don't know a lot about Lefanu, but he seems like a progressive guy for his time. Maybe? I could All be right. reading it exactly wrong, though. I mean... Maybe in his mind he's like, those awful, horrible, inverted women. Blah, 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 blah. These sinful slatterns. One stole my wife. <laughs> I shall expose them for the whores they are. Yes. We got like a good scene for a script about Lefanu here, I think, going on. You know, fair enough, so you didn't really find much trouble with it. As I say, for me... The language, I thought, was off-putting. Not horrible, but it's not something that I would really read for, like, just pleasure for certain. Um, as, as just a little mention, I'm not sure if it's free on Amazon, but if it's not, you can just go to Gutenberg.org, uh, since it is completely in the public domain by now, and grab a free copy there and take a read-through or take a, you know, try a sample, see what you think, so. I got it free on Kindle uh, as part of, like, a collection of, like, a hundred gothic tales. There you go. While we're uh, aciding, there have been many adaptations of the story. My favorite being a web series called Carmilla on YouTube. The action of the book is about half the first episode. So, and it's modernized and it takes place at a college instead of a schloss. I think it's cool and I just yesterday heard that they're making a movie out of it. Interesting. I'm assuming there are probably some adaptations with like titles like Sexy Woman vampire <laughs> loving or something right probably uh so let's go to the ugly uh here we're going to talk about the monster of the piece it's racism no it's um, <laughs> not this time it's vampires right uh, Car right. uh carmilla is a vampire how how do the vampires here differ from you know say the more normal twilight vampires <laughs> i like the fan used vampire i wish he had written more okay so what carmilla can do and she's the only vampire we meet, unless her fake mother was uh, also one. We don't know. 
She can pass through solid matter. She can appear as a dark cloud. She can teleport. She bites through two extendable fangs, and she bites just below the collarbone instead of into the neck. What she does, and this is so grotesque, I love it. I, I'm amazed I've never seen it before. She, she feeds on the blood. She turns into vapor, goes back to her crypt, where she expresses the blood into her coffin and bathes in it. Hmm. So she doesn't actually ingest the blood. Uh, and that's what, what keeps her uh, uh, continually alive. One thing I really like, and th this uh, could go in good, except we're at the end. When uh, Carmilla is sort of teleporting around the room, like when someone tries to strike her, she's suddenly over beside them. Lefanu writes that whole scene without using the word suddenly, which I had to use just now when I was talking about it. Mm. And I think that's brilliant. I myself have a hard time excising suddenly from my writing when I'm doing like heavy action. He just did that so beautifully. And the end result uh, of this uh, choice is that it's not so much, it doesn't seem like she pops out of existence here and pops into existence over there. It seems like his perception maybe is, is being glitched. So he's he's aiming over here, and then he looks at, oh, she's over there. Mm. Oh, maybe. Then a cat walks by twice. Yes. It's not explicitly stated that that's what's happening, but a lot of her powers are messing with people's perceptions, messing with people's minds. So I think, personally, I think her shape-shifting and her teleportation might be a mind effect, although passing through solid matter, she kind of has to do it literally. <laughs> Unless she... Mind affects everyone to look the other way while she goes to a door, I guess, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, or uh, it is implied she goes out a window once, mm -hmm. but she gets into her crypt without disturbing the the vines and mosses that grow over it. Ah, I see. But she might have a secret passage. You know, it has just come to me that Elizabeth Bathory <laughs> was active in the 16th century, so I wonder oh. if... Uh, there were perhaps shades of that. I, I want, like, a sequel now where it's revealed that uh, Elizabeth Bathory was, in fact, a vampire. Possibly. So we discover not only is Carmilla a vampire, and we don't actually name it until the vampire hunter comes and says, Oh, what you're looking at is a vampire. And everyone goes, What? Duh. <laughs> There's no such thing as a vampire. Really, get this priest over here and we'll talk about it. So not only is Carmilla a vampire... But she is the Mercalla Countess Karnstein. They're in Germany, so Karnstein, I guess. From three or four generations ago, uh, a ruined castle in the neighborhood. And Carmilla is an anagram of Mercalla. They discover what she is because one of their neighbors had taken Carmilla in and had the same thing happen to his daughter. His daughter died. And so he came to warn our family and said, oh, that sounds bad. Let me get my friend the wacko to tell us what to do. And then they use secret means to find Carmilla's tomb. They dig it open with the help of a handy woodcutter just in the neighborhood. <laughs> On his way to grandmother's house. There she is in her coffin of blood and they behead her and drive a stake through her heart. And, and another thing I like is Carmilla is not cold and dead. She's lying there, breathing, rosy-cheeked, eyes open, unsettlingly, hmm. in the coffin. But but sort of in, in a stupor, I guess. And then standard, when they start attacking her, she screams. But that's it. So we don't know about the mother. Oh, and the final, final phrase. <laughs> I think I hear Carmilla's footsteps out in the hall. <laughs> So, so we, we pull that bullshit, which I, I think was probably relatively new back then compared to now. But it, it made me want to read more. I want him to write more. But he's dead. Pretty sure that he wrote other things. Uh, he did, but uh, I hadn't heard of any of them. No? Uh, best known works are Uncle Silas, uh, Carmilla, and The House by the Churchyard. Also, The Cock and Anchor. <laughs> yeah. It makes me wonder, and... You know, I don't know, I haven't read enough of it. You can tell me if I'm just totally imprinting my own thoughts on this or what, but I kind of wonder if the mother is meant to be, like, the last keeper in Let the Right One In. I wonder if Carmilla has to kind of trade out her lover, who then, you know, her, like, 
person who she's in love with as a young woman who then grows up and has to pretend to be her mother and then eventually gets old enough so that she has to drop her off at someone else's place. It's possible. And I should mention that when the neighbor tells his story uh, of Carmilla, a.k.a. Mercala, she also was dropped off by a mother who swerved to secrecy. So I'm, I'm curious about her. Yeah, I mean, your, your theory is as good as any. But Carmilla definitely likes the young ladies. Uh, and there's also kind of in the background, wow, there's this... Um, kind of plague going around hitting young ladies in the region <laughs> so clearly she's been doing this for a while she really should maybe kind of widen her circle <laughs> so the van helsing characters don't uh, find out where she is and track her down yeah <laughs> and you know what if if you want to read it i'm kind of sorry because there's almost nothing left except what we've talked about <laughs> but i think it's worthwhile if you don't mind the the antique language that kind of answers the question, would you recommend this to someone? Just it. So, what do you guys think of Carmilla? What do you think of the cock and anchor? Anything <laughs> else by Le Fenu that uh, we haven't covered? Uh, let us know. Dread.dialectic at gmail.com And again, if you have something that you've written, a uh, novella or novel, uh, let us know. You know, if you're like, I think Skix would probably enjoy this, whereas Michael would not, or vice versa, then feel free to mention which one of us you think would like it more. I like it the gayer the better. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I uh, <laughs> and and as usual, you know, like I think I, I think my tastes run a little more straightforward, um, in, in general. No, no pun intended. Too bad. Next time we're gonna be talking about Jazz Pierre, uh, another book that I got from Insta Freebie. A little kind of look into the dark heart uh, of man, uh, or uh, what have you. Um, but for now, this is Michael D. Bradley, and this is Geeks Maddox. We are. Oh.